We live in a world of apparent contradictions that are meant to dance with each other and not to be polarized. It certainly seems like a time for leaving binaries behind. There's a beautiful opportunity just to get to know other parts of ourselves. And then when we open into that space, we find some real power. And something really happens when we bring all of those parts of ourselves and, and really embody more of our wholeness. Hello and welcome to our final episode of this series, series six of All That We Are. Throughout this year, we've had a lot of shifts happening from behind the scenes. This has included our name change and our new tech platform and app. It's time for us to take a break from making the podcast so that we can nurture the membership and take that vital space for integration where everything lands. As I'm sure you've gathered by now, the tech build has been longer and more challenging and expensive than we imagined. And what will make it all worth it now is for it to come alive with your sharing and connection. Even though it's been a really deep and difficult journey on this side, I really feel that it's a really powerful offering, that it can connect us in ways and that it's private and it's away from so much of the noise. I really want this to be a sacred space on your phone that in amongst the kind of mindless clicking that when you actually want to go into something that's nurturing, that you can click into this app and connect with beautiful, beautiful people, as well as watch some of the resources and the tree whispers and the courses and things that you find there. Now we have rolled Presence Collective and the Future is Beautiful patrons into one thing, the All That We Are membership. And you can join this either annually or monthly. We also have an option to make a one-off donation to support us with the costs of this creation and to help us to improve the app and the tech platform as there are still things that we would like to do. All the links and information about this is available on our website, allthatweare.org forward slash support. It's constantly a journey running something like this that shifts culture and goes against the grain of the status quo. That's why we need it to be a community effort. Without core funding, it can get quite tiring on the back end, especially when different projects build up in the case of this year. I am personally feeling so expanded after sharing a workshop on intuition at All About Love Festival this past weekend. That combined with the food poisoning, which delayed this episode by a week, has been quite a transformation and a shedding of skins. One of the most wonderful parts was to meet so many of you that listen and hear how this podcast and all of this work touches you. During the break, I'll be able to tend to the community space, as well as offer another round of beautiful leadership mentoring and an intuitive flow course. Many of you have been asking for both and September feels like a good time. I'm adding more to the mentoring, part of which is rituals that we do together, or you do in your own space, some with an activist feel, some nature connection, and some to support you in fully stepping into your truth. The leadership mentoring is really a space of you connecting deeper to who you are and letting go of some of the most hard to reach patterns in a soft, gentle, and powerful way. I am also in the process of organizing for us to have our own, all that we are, water bottles, mugs, organic t-shirts, bags, and such like. These will be ready very soon, and we would love for you to bring us into your everyday world in this way. So as we take this time stepping away from creating podcasts, I'll be able to bring some clarity, some integration, and some new energy to everything else. For me, I'm really looking forward to having that space for my own creativity so I can really feel into what's needed and how we can come together in even more beautiful and expansive ways. If you aren't on our newsletter, then please do join us there as that's where you'll be kept in the loop. And you can find many of these offerings are already there on our events page. For the All That We Are membership, here is the new offering. You can download our app from Apple and Google so that you can do our courses and connect through the social network here. And we would love for you that become members to really share your experiences of the platform so that we can keep improving it. 
we've accidentally become a bit of a tech company as well as an events company and a podcast company. And then, of course, that all in addition with the spiritual work and the beautiful, expansive sessions and courses and experiences that we offer. I really feel that the balance of having an amazing global digital community of people that are interested in similar questions alongside the in-person communities is so important. It expands us in ways we can't explain as well as creating so many opportunities and connections. What you give as a member is that you support the making of the podcast, which keeps really good information and inspiration available for free all over the world, including those that are not able to access our courses and membership. You support an all-female and racially diverse team, which is really rare in media spaces. You support a space of soul and beautiful ideas and culture change. You make monthly donations to Tree Sisters and Choose Love, and we adjust these donations that we make as the membership grows so that we're planting trees and supporting refugees, specifically out at sea with the equipment to help refugees that find themselves at sea. You become part of our cycle of reciprocity. Rather than listening, consuming the podcast, you really become part of it. You nourish us as a team and you pay it forward so we keep making podcasts and doing all of these things. And it allows us to have the podcast and the membership and the events and to really feel supported like we're in this together. And then, of course, there are things that you get from being a member So you get the monthly soul space sessions with me and these are events a little bit different to the circles that we were doing in Presence Collective and the check-ins that we were doing with the Future is Beautiful patrons. But these soul sessions will be at the beginning very practice based and then there'll be chance to ask me any questions about themes that have come up in the podcast, things that might be happening in your own life and receive like support and guidance in a really loving community, as well as have an opportunity to come together to to meditate, to kind of experience breath work and to get nurtured and supported. You'll get the monthly tree whispers, which we share every month um, and they're just very beautiful contemplations for you to take into your month. You receive a whole library of workshops, movement sessions, and meditations. There is so much already there in the membership that you can connect to and explore. And you get connection to our community through our own social network. So we're saying here, no algorithms, no advertising, no data selling, no monitoring. It's an independent space to connect with others who are interested in the themes of this podcast. And therefore, you get to make friends and collaborations with others in the space. You have access to our app, so you have a sacred inspirational space to visit directly from your phone. And discounts to all that we are experiences, both online and in person. And you get to be part of something that's powered by humans, not corporations, and also not funding bodies. We're really doing this in a very organic way. As the membership grows, and so, of course... If we have just a few members, it's a lot for us to to give. But as the membership really grows, you each pay just your small monthly contribution and it allows us to have something to really play with so that we can really expand our offering. And so what we'd like to do is hire a community host to make your experience in the space more beautiful, add extra functionality to our app, such as finding members who are physically close to you right now, which can add to the synchronicity. And so you might be passing through Somerset and not realize that this is where I'm based. And then it will alert us so that then we can connect and go for a walk. And I can't wait for that to happen Um, so that we can actually create more of that in-person connection and more intimate connection, as well as a bigger online connections. We would also be able to create more member events, including special guests, movement and in-person events. It would allow us to add more cutting edge aspects to the technology we offer. We have already created this using open source technology and can add other elements such as blockchain and crypto as we're able to utilize Web3 to create a digital experience that is of the future. We can create more episodes of the podcast with ease and grace. 
organize more in-person experiences, workshops, retreats, gatherings, pilgrimages, host more learning journeys and courses, host weekly meditations and yoga classes, launch our podcast club where we'll have a weekly space to discuss podcast episodes with other members and be a fully people-powered movement of change and sacred space. And of course, grow our team so that we're more resourced and able to offer our most beautiful leadership and inspiration. If this podcast means something to you, please do get behind us at this junction and support our work through membership. If we can get just two or 300 of you to join, which is a very small percentage of all of you that are here and that are listening, it really will change so much for us. Through that, shift our culture as we can share more and do more. And I just really urge you to know that your membership really makes a difference in this model because it's based on a bigger number of you coming together and giving just a little. So if you've been meaning to get round to it or if you've been on the fence, um, please do jump in. It, it means so much to us. For this week, my guest is Nina Simons, who I hand over the reins to ask me the questions. Nina is a dear mentor of mine. She is the co-founder and chief relationship strategist at Bioneers and leads its Every Woman's Leadership Programme. Bioneers is a nonprofit that uses media convening and connecting to lift up visionary and practical solutions for many of our most pressing social and ecological challenges using a whole system approach. Nina is a social entrepreneur who is passionate about reinventing leadership, restoring the feminine and co-creating a healthy, peaceful and equitable world for all. She speaks and teaches internationally at schools, conferences and festivals and co-facilitates transformative workshops and retreats for women that share practices for regenerative leadership through relational mindfulness. Throughout her remarkable career, spanning the nonprofit, social entrepreneurship, corporate and philanthropic sectors, Nina has worked with nearly a thousand diverse women leaders across disciplines, race, class, age, orientation, and more to create conditions for mutual learning and leadership development. She produces and speaks at large scale events to work intimately to help small diverse groups of women leaders knit together and strengthen each other's work, pursuing intersectional healing and ecological justice. Nina is the author of Nature, Culture and the Sacred, A Woman Listens for Leadership. In this conversation entitled Embracing All That We Are, we explore the themes of leadership, community and reciprocity as we speak to the question, how do we shift culture and guide the change? I hope that this is medicine for your soul and open something for you. We'll be back on air in the autumn sometime. In the meantime, find us at our membership events and through our newsletter. And of course, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to All That We Are with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between activism, the sacred, creativity, and regeneration. The spaces where our inner and outer worlds dance. From healing trauma to nature connection, to new technologies, to ancient wisdom, it's time for us to move beyond silos and into an integrated way of being. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a more beautiful future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to listen, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing and envisioning, we create the futures of our wildest dreams and we begin to embody all that we are, all that we are becoming and all that is possible. Amisha, I am so, so honored that you invited me to join you for this closing podcast of this chapter and the transition into a new realm and a new life for this body of work that you have tended so beautifully. I need to say that when I first met Amisha, 
I don't know, maybe two, three years ago, when she invited me to be on a podcast interview with her, I was kind of gobsmacked, truthfully. (laughs) Here was this woman who I had never heard of, never seen before, with a quality of presence and of being able to bring all of herself in a way that I have long admired and sought for myself and helped other women cultivate over the last 20 years. And the quality of your perception, Amisha, and your presence is truly a gift. So it's my great, great honor to be with you today. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Nina. And so lovely the way that you opened because I normally do that like without everyone listening. And it was so nice to bring everyone listening into that space. When I remember actually that the first podcast that we did together, I was in San Francisco after Bioneers. I was actually staying in a very dodgy, like downtown noisy hotel. (laughs) And I'd had a few drinks the night before because I'd been at a Halloween fancy dress party. (laughs) So I really appreciate your reflection because I wasn't feeling my best self. That's so funny. I forgot that completely. (laughs) Uh, Well, and it's a gift to me that you've experienced pioneers because really, since I didn't have children in this life, I chose not to. Pioneers has been my child who I have helped cultivate and raise. And like you, with the future is beautiful and all that we are, I am a cultivator of community. And so for you to have experienced that community and that we think of it as a living system sculpture, it's a great honor to me and helps me to ground in your knowledge of my life and my vision and my passion and my work. So thank you for coming all that way. Yeah, the... <laughs> The pleasure has been all mine and both times I've been there, I found it really a special experience with incredible, open-hearted and very smart people that really, really care. And I also really appreciate the creativity and the music and, and the energy and that it really does feel like a family that you've cultivated. The last one that I was at, which was just before we met, that was, was that the 30th anniversary? One. Was it 2019, I'm guessing? Yeah. Yes. That felt so special. And I felt like, wow, you can really feel like how something builds and how it becomes such a strong part of people's lives. And, you know, kids that may have like come with their parents, like then coming independently with their friends and people moving through so many cycles and having something that really nourishes them and feeds them and, and gives them direction. Well, and I think what we share also is that, you know, as I was thinking about this interview today, I was realizing that part of what you do, Amisha, which I so deeply resonate with, is to integrate the spiritual and the political and the ecological and everything in between and the economy and the and and to recognize that it's a whole system view that you take. And for me, that's what I've been nurturing for a long time. So that's lovely. And the other thing I'm aware of hearing you is that I believe that was the year that my mother had just died. And so I was very open and raw. And I, you know, I spoke about my experience of her death and what that meant to me. And of course, I'm still integrating it here three years later. But uh, yeah, that was a big year. And I'm glad you were able to witness it. So I wonder whether you'd like to talk about this as a last episode here at the beginning or towards the end. I'm happy to to share a bit about it. I mean, we're just taking a break. It might be short. We always work in series and some podcasts, you know, it's just it's every week and it never stops because we don't have funding and we kind of do this with so much love. Like it takes a lot and it is amazing. I absolutely love it, but I find for my own spiritual practice that a lot happens in the quieter times. And so I try and plan times in my year where 
I'm not making podcasts and I'm not seeing clients. Those are the times where I can really, really, really drop into my own experience on on a different level. And sometimes it gives me space to fall apart a little bit and to kind of really complete a death cycle and move into a rebirth. Sometimes it gives me time to really play and to really bring like a new energy of joy. Sometimes it's time to like really go deep in my practice and go offline and be either sitting with a teacher or out in nature. And I feel like those times are so important for us all to take in whatever way we can. And and of course, it can be in, in the micro ways. But um, yeah, we, we haven't decided as a team when we're coming back, partly because this year, I have felt really tired a lot of the year. And so I just wanted to have a break to like, let some things land. And then of course, it's all like landed in the last week, and I don't need a break now. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but you something- may still need it. Yeah, but yes. something will happen in that timeout. That um, yeah, and actually, it's really nice to be going into that timeout, not feeling that tiredness that's been with me, which has been a lot around grief and responsibility and caring, and also around community and how much it takes to create for community. We opened up this thing of building an app last year to connect our community and it's ended up being such a long journey it's ended up costing more money and taking up more of my time and it's interesting because I already was doing a little bit too much before and then this has been like a whole extra part and so I feel like now the tech is finished I just want to step back from the podcast a little bit then we can sort of step a bit more into the community events and recharge and just allow everything to breathe a little bit it strikes me that that's such a wise perspective and decision for you to make really i'm currently just entering the first sabbatical of my entire life i mean as you know i have a tendency to see the world through somewhat gender-colored lenses, you know, what I see is that part of the legacy of a patriarchal and capitalist culture and colonialist culture is that we all have a tendency to emphasize doing over being to an extent that's really unhealthy. Most of the people I know who really care deeply about our collective future and the state of the world tend to overwork. You know, one of my favorite teachers says the feminine, by which I mean the feminine in all of us, not just women, but all of us have, having masculine and feminine, the feminine thrives in spaciousness. And I've now been away from work for a week and I can feel it's like my aura is expanding. I can feel how badly I need the rest and the spaciousness to tend to the parts of my life that may have been undernourished while I've been, you know, heavily focused on manifesting whatever I've been working on. I I just admire your wisdom in that. It does take a lot, and it takes a lot on every level. You know, and Kenny and I both Kenny is my husband and partner who I've been working, I've been married to for 35 years and working with for all of that, we both are exhausted from 35 years of, as you say, of fundraising and responsibility and a kind of relentless feeling of being lashed to the wheel, which Kenny has a new idea for our next conference, which will be next April in Berkeley. And we're really excited about it. And it's big wheels are turning that really we are witnessing such profound changes in every aspect of our lives, from the the weather to our governance, to our economies, to our education, to our inner selves and self-cultivation and care. It's a time that requires a lot of attention and care to navigate and not 
give ourselves, not deplete ourselves by overgiving. Yeah, it's one that many of us are always working with. It's true. I mean, and I find that even though, you know, we started Bioneers in response to climate change in 1990. And so for so many years, in some part of my mind and heart and being, I have known that a time like this was coming, but I could never have anticipated the confluence of so many crises at once and how that would affect us as a species. You know, I'm curious to ask you, Amisha, because I find you deeply, deeply intelligent relationally, intuitively, and in terms of our emotions and trauma. I'm curious about what you see from all that you've learned about what's most needed to help our species reclaim equilibrium and to help heal some of the trauma that we're all feeling. Thank you for that question, Nina. I feel like we're all feeling quite exhausted from how many things there are to fight all the time. I was doing um, a workshop, a talk at a festival all about love this weekend, about intuition, which I really feel is a life skill that we all need because it connects us really to who we are and also to our ability to discern. One of the things that I was sharing that feels really just worth repeating is that it's really hard to live in a world that operates like against what feels like common sense to us. There's all this around conspiracy theories and reptiles and and like where you want to take that. But actually, just one example is that, say, in England, energy prices just rose and they're going to rise again in October and they're going to rise again um, next year as well. And meanwhile, the gas companies are actually boasting about their profits this year. And that's somehow okay. And so we live in a world where that's just okay. And it's like, what we've all done basic maths and we're all paying more and they're making more money and they're making more profit. So it's not even that they're making more money that they need, like, because it's all more expensive, you know, and that is being like allowed by the government here. And of course, it affects the people on the lowest incomes, the worst, it's kind of, it sort of, it wipes out the middle class a bit because when your house bills double, like that's then your disposable income, like just goes down, disappears and your ability to do things for yourself. That's just like one example. And then of course we've seen with COVID how quickly things can change and how much cooperation is possible. And yet with climate change, it doesn't seem to be possible. And that's really confusing for our whole like brain and body and our whole human experience. And so I feel like some of the tiredness that I've been experiencing this year and last year as well, some of it is, of course, to do with my own personal situation and other bits of it are to do with what feels like a kind of collective onslaught of different issues like cropping up well okay but energy prices wasn't a problem before (laughs) so then now suddenly we've all got to make more money and then in the case of something like this it means that a lot of the people that are part of this community are activists and don't have like big jobs and so then they're all like writing to me saying, sorry, I have to cancel my membership because of all of these rising bills. And then I'm also in that same position. You can see how it just kind of like pulls on these, like these things that create a strength and the, the spaces where we can gather more resilience for ourselves. And when the energy prices rose, I have a lot of friends that work in like well-being in different ways. And immediately like well-being became a luxury rather than a necessity and then you're like oh like this is so challenging because we need all of these offerings and these ways in order to release trauma and to understand ourselves deeper and to to step deeper into our resilience and at the same time I also feel 
that what's always available to all of us is that opportunity to become part of the times that we live in. And there's always energetically kind of new skills that are available that we can tap into. And we, we, we change, you know, with the times that we're in. And so making ourselves really open and adaptable to that so that we're able to receive what it is that we need to receive in order to, to really be able to hold ourselves in these times. That also can be quite a tiring process because it takes a lot of energy. It's like a pressure cooker that we're in and physically it's very hot. Like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of grappling with the information that in 50 years, the part of India that my entire family's from will be too hot to live in. And like, what does that mean? And 50 years isn't very long. And also we don't know how accurate those figures are because I've also seen that, say the temperatures in the UK this summer match like 2027 predictions. And so it might all be happening faster than we imagined. And so I feel like we have to keep tapping into resilience, into community, into joy, like finding our joy in, in amongst it all, really allowing ourselves to, to rest. And in that resting time we receive, I feel like that's when we receive so much of the, the new information that will support us on an inner level. Yeah, just staying, staying strong, like not allowing ourselves to kind of feel really defeated in this time. And um, at the same time, finding that balance between not taking on too much of it so that we burn out because, you know, burnout is such a, a moment of burnout and people that really care about our future, which is everyone listening to this conversation we have that propensity to burn out because we want to take it on. In the From Me to We journey that you were part of, Claire Dubois spoke really eloquently about burnout and how the planet's burning out and her experiences with it all. And yeah, I feel like we have to really resource ourselves. I found cold water immersion <laughs> of in, the, in the rivers of England, which was never something I was never... My my genetics are from another another climate completely, but as I'm here, I've really found that like that kind of balancing my energy within the water and taking that time to to go on these like wild swims has been really really resourcing, as has you know, sitting with the incredible trees that we have here in this land. That series that you produced, the From Me to We series. I think was quite profound and very, very important for this time. It strikes me, Amisha, as I listen to you, that I so agree with you about resourcing ourselves and about how we care for ourselves to avert burnout and continue to prioritize self-care equally with world care. Otherwise, the burnout thing perpetuates. And I'm also so aware that most or all of us are products of a culture that has not known really how to relate to emotion or the value of our emotions. I've heard it said that uh, emotions are nature's way of communicating with us. There has been so much grief and loss in the last few years, and also so much to be angered by. You know, that in addition to the confusion, and as you so well described, that violation of common sense that we're all being confronted with over and over again, I'm also aware that the lack of safe places in community to express emotion is one of the things that I feel drawn to help change. Because what I find is that when people are given an opportunity to really express. I mean, one of my favorite teachers is a woman named Carla McLaren, and she wrote a book called The Language of Emotions. And in it, she says that anger is your body's way of telling you that a boundary has been trespassed. You know, we are having our boundaries trespassed in all kinds of ways all the time right now. 
creating some sort of communal safe spaces where people can actually feel and express emotion feels like a really important part of the medicine that's needed for now. Being able to communicate our communicate like the, the truth of how we're feeling and also to to move emotion to move that energy through is so important I've always been somebody that's felt a lot and so I've had to really really work on this and I notice it still it can still terrify people especially if it is anger or frustration or or, or real real sadness I feel especially in spiritual community, there can be so much like focus on the joy and focus on, you know, if you're seen to be crying or to be frustrated, then it's weak somehow. And you haven't really done your spiritual work or your evolution. And I find that it's actually, you know, there's so much bypassing and there's so much disconnecting new age spirituality has really taught us so much that we need to you know, follow our joy and like you know the language is all like kind of manifesting your dream life and and all of this and it's like well yeah I get it and I know a lot of people that do it and they do it really well and they have loads of money and they do always seem happy you know but they're just going from like high peak experience to peak experience like having this wonderful time and good for them for me, it doesn't feel real enough. And I don't know if that's just to do with like the personality types that I am, that I will just never, I, we talked about this as well on From Me to We. Um, I remember having this with Jeremy Lent in the session that he was in. And I was saying that for me, like, you know, when I go to these really beautiful places and go to ecstatic dances and things like that, it's really nurturing for a minute. And then it just gets like a little bit like, I, I need to be more connected to the to where we really are and to to really like witness people suffering the suffering that's actually happening in the world and to, to see what I can do with that I don't want to not have that suffering part of my reality like we have more climate refugees than any other kind of refugee we have several actual wars happening at the moment not just in the Ukraine yeah we have a real crisis with so many people that don't have a home and that don't have financial resources. And it's not true that they can all just manifest <laughs> their dream life. Yeah, I find it really challenging or the you would just have to remove that from your reality and like kind of create a different reality and really just be always in that space of, of our joy. Because I mean, joy and play are so powerful, but so is grief and so is anger and so is frustration and so is being honest with where we're at. For me, I find that I really appreciate being around people that can really share like where they're at and express themselves. Um, otherwise, you have experiences. I, I had one recently where I spent a weekend with somebody that wasn't in that place where they could really express themselves. It just kind of brings up all this kind of passive aggressive kind of energy it was like a very draining like experience, not because of the person suffering, but because of not being able to actually be real about what was being experienced. And I find that when we're able to be vulnerable in what we're experiencing, like that's really when community can show up. And it's also when, when we can move something through, it's always been that, you know, I have to allow myself to feel things and to understand like what I'm feeling. And then like find the way that it, it releases as we go in these cycles of death and rebirth, as I allow myself to really be with the discomfort that there is and responsibility isn't easy and continually showing up issues isn't easy and living amongst all of these systems of oppression, it's not easy. So of course, we're going to struggle at times. We also have to remember that we haven't had very good training and education around any of this and so we're not very good at it unless we've really worked hard or found the right resources I apologize if you could hear Shambo the puppy he is playing in the background while whilst we're okay. here like in the 
in the depth of of where it's tricky. And and that's the beauty of this world, right? That everything's always always exists and and that things move through and that we can all exist with with it all together. But yeah, I just feel like we can't really grow. Like we don't step into the next phase of who we are if we're not able to to really face what's challenging. It's not about like always like going through like all of the childhood traumas and and all of that. Sometimes I feel that works really, really helpful. And that's the work that I do in my leadership mentoring as part of that, as well as as well as other things. But finding ways to express how we feel and it might be out in nature. I find that so powerful. It just you can go and offer your tears to the trees or offer your anger and really like know that everything's welcome and that the trees aren't going to get triggered and judge you in the way that some humans will. And there are so many humans that also won't do that. And when you find those really keep them close because they're such an incredible resource when you find the people that will love you and sit with you through the whole spectrum of your being and that recognize how important each bit is to the other bits. No, it's so true. And I personally feel that we as a species all over this globe are really going through a valley of shadows while all the systems are completely outdated and breaking down. We are still, as you said earlier, under the grip of a system that essentially is a plutocracy. So it's really run by the elites, and it's run by the elites to continue to centralize their power and their wealth. And in the meantime, it impoverishes the people, the planet, and all of life. But, you know, I love remembering that, as Carl Jung said, You know, if you go into the darkness and you go all the way into it, that's where you can see the stars. I'm increasingly mindful that we don't get one without the other. We live in a world of apparent contradictions that are meant to dance with each other and not to be polarized. It certainly seems like a time for leaving binaries behind. Yeah, absolutely. There's a a group of wise women that live um, near me here in Somerset that I I saw recently they I know they listen to this podcast and come on retreat with me and and they're like yeah like our shadows are really really coming up at the moment and this year and last year and it kind of will keep going till like October like this is really a time of, of really seeing ourselves you know our shadows are in part the the aspects of ourselves that you know, we might find ugly, but they're also just the bits that we don't know. And so there's a beautiful opportunity just to get to know other parts of ourselves. And then when we open into that space, we find some real power and something really happens when we bring all of those parts of ourselves and, and really embody more of our wholeness. And it's it's so powerful. And I feel like more and more of us need to really do that at this time. And that's part of what leadership is right now it's being able to step into our wholeness and also to really understand our own path and understand what it is that we have to offer because we're being entrained as as followers through all of these social media platforms that we spend so much time on we're being made to feel powerless in so many ways and that's what capitalism and all these things do and then even with the new age spirituality and this kind of focus on everyone kind of manifesting the same kinds of things and I feel like there's such power in really understanding what your life is for what it is that you're here to offer to understand your ancestry and and what's like moving through you and and what's out there in the future that's coming through you in whatever way and to be doing the work that's being asked of you and work makes it sound heavy but I feel like it's really just being and living and sometimes it can be really playful but that's what we need to be doing and I feel like because I get asked a lot 
like how do you know if it's your intuition if it's your fear if it's you know what it what it is and and my answer to that is that you know I can't tell you because that's the beauty of the initiation of intuition is that you have to learn your own language and that there are so many different ways and I can give signposts to help you and one of those is to create an intuition diary where you write down the insights and whether you followed it or not and how you felt it in your body and what you did just before that and and then how that worked out so you can actually kind of analyze the data if you like and kind of bring the intuitive and the rational together and allow them to really work as this intelligence that is meant to be balanced and, and joined but because as we know witch hunts and colonization and everything else it's not yeah it's not about like the path that's the most fun it's about the path that feels the most clear and sometimes that is really hard it's it's taking a decision to do something that's going to be difficult that is going to be challenging there's parts of you that really doesn't want to do but you can feel in your body that you have to that there's a responsibility there that that's like an, an initiatory passage for you that you will become more of who you are through doing that and i feel like that's a huge like distinction that we need to really make at this time that we're not all trying to become the same that we're we're trying to listen more deeply to our gifts and how we can contribute yes and trust the guidance that informs the next clear step because we can't always know the full path in fact all we can know is the next clear step i love that and it really goes hand in hand with something i was thinking about earlier about how much we need to cultivate our own sense of both appreciating our own gifts and our own particular forms of guidance and language how you know our guides our ancestors our intuition our dream time communicates to us about the next clear step and also as you are saying so well to really shed the conditioning that says be a follower and compare yourself to other people and instead really cultivate a sense of agency because as you were speaking earlier about the difficulties of navigating the economic hardship now in the UK with energy prices you know i found myself thinking about new forms of economy i have a friend developing something she calls beloved economies and another that's working on comparing indigenous traditional economy systems with you know what we can co-create now and i found myself just imagining you know that we may be heading toward a time of far less currency and far more exchange and an economy that's based on reciprocity and as you were saying that's based on the model of nature's generosity nature provides and i recently was so struck i saw a beautiful little short video on youtube that's called the mycelium is listening and it's a marvelous psychonaut kind of film but it's got paul stamets you know the father of mycology really speaking about how science has now learned that mycelium actually respond to frequency to sound frequency he says in this little film that when thunder and lightning happen the mycelium are listening and getting their messages that lightning literally electrifies a whole community of mycelium and that mycelium is especially respondent to the low frequency sound of drums and when you think about our traditional ancestors and the ceremonies that they would do to call in the rain and to ask for fertility and to express their gratitude to the elements the mycelium is actually listening to those drum beats and responding by bringing bountiful food so you know it's a it's another version of we're all connected to remember that nature is actually listening and plants i mean plants can see color they don't see with eyes but they have receptors all over them 
that actually can tell the difference between someone wearing red and someone wearing blue. You know, so there, there's so much magic and mystery in our relationship to that natural world, as you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel it's a it's a both and because we do still live in capitalism. Of course. I suppose part of my fear is that as there is more of an intensity that people stop supporting things that they really care about, that this, that all that we are is an example. And that actually, you know, how do we really make that shift of acknowledging like what it is that we really care about and and giving our resources to that. So we, for example, I give money to Tree Sisters and Choose Love and tree planting and Choose Love is for refugees. And it's easy to say, oh, I don't have that disposable money anymore. But it's like, I know that these organizations like that and all creative projects of people doing something, it requires that. And I would hate for a lot of the beautiful things that are happening to kind of get wiped out because otherwise they just become only for the really, really, really privileged and the people that really don't have to worry about paying their bills. And yeah, I don't know. It's interesting because I, I don't really operate from that kind of that lack place with this. I mean, I do in some ways, but like not in not in the way of like, if you don't support this, it will stop because I know that it's on my path to offer this, but I feel like I've got to a place this year where this tech build, the managing of that, it was like a whole extra job that actually would have required another human being, but because we don't have the resources, it just had to be me. And so then it it just really pushed me beyond. And I feel that that's the thing with community that we We all want to be part of communities, but we have quite a capitalist relationship to it as well, where it's sort of like come in and take and not the reciprocity. As I'm getting older and I'm getting more tired and I have other responsibilities, I know I know my limits because for me, doing the leadership mentoring and the podcast like works really well and retreats here and there. But then when you add in the whole community piece, it's so much more. It's huge. And you know how much it is to hold and and then also how much you have to also hold what people are going through and and receive a lot of projection and and all of that i i kind of want to open this like membership up for one last attempt because we've been trying to raise our costs through our kind of patrons and membership since the beginning of the podcast and we we've never really got there And then in the meantime, I've been sort of like, oh, maybe if we did it like this or if we did it like that. And it wouldn't take much, actually. Like it's a very small percentage of listeners that would make the difference, like a huge difference. And it would mean that we could hire somebody that could actually help with lots of things. Yeah, I just feel that at this point, it's all fine, however it plays out. But if there are people that have been wanting to like get more involved or show their support, like this is a really good time because I've set a bit of a okay, there's a six month experiment now with this. If that doesn't work, like maybe it's time to go towards advertising of products that are, you know, conscious and aligned, of which there's there's many, there's many like supplements that I take or whatever, but, but then actually to acknowledge that um, holding the community piece, it makes it too much on my own. I, I feel okay with sharing that because it's not about creating like a facade. I'm just a person and I have a few people that freelance and a few people that volunteer. That's it. We don't have big funding behind us. We don't have a full-time team. I'm not even full-time. What's kind of interesting is that I opened up at the beginning the patrons to raise money to make the podcast. And then it became a whole membership thing, which added more to the offering, which meant that then there's more work. And then the whole tech thing added even more. And it's upped our costs. So now we're in this position where our monthly costs have risen quite a lot in order to make this offering. And so it's just a time where I'm not attached to what happens. But yeah, I feel like there's a there's a timeline to sort of see, does this work? And is there room for that digital community that supports the in-person community? Because obviously, the more members we have, the more resources we have, and then we can organize more things in person and and all of that, everything kind of 
expands out and then we're able to to hold like a, a deeper space and and the issue is like with volunteers is that it's a lot of work to explain everything to people and then they they burn out too because they're not getting what they need in order to pay their bills and yeah i'm just curious like if this can really become like a fully community supported project not what it has been which is actually me kind of upholding it all and not asking for very much actually from the community and it's not actually very much it's really 30 pounds a month but if we had 200 people do that it would literally change our whole experience and that's a very small amount of the number of people that listen and I'm so grateful for everything that this space has created I've been to a few festivals this weekend and I've had loads of people come and tell me like how much different episodes have affected them and and opened up things for them and I'm really I'm really happy to keep offering that space, but I want to give this one more, one more shot to see if it's possible to be a community supported project at these challenging times. Well, and I think honestly, Amisha, that what you're offering is of really deep value. I mean, I find it kind of soul nourishing. And as someone who loves to learn, there are a few places that I'd rather learn than what you're producing. You know, one of the things we're challenged with in these times of the pandemic and the economic crisis and, you know, climate on and on is a sense of isolation. This is part of the, the kernel of from me to we. How do we go from a society that says, if I'm okay, that's all that matters? to saying, no, I'm going to tend to my community. And what you have become is an incredible hearth tender, which is, you know, a way of bringing the community together around a council fire that's very purely intention, that's very skillful, that's very vulnerable and real, but also highly intelligent and discerning. How do we show our appreciation and our value for that? Because I would love to see you and the community that you have fostered show up in this way to really help lift it. It does feel to me, again, being someone who tends to see the world through gender-colored lenses, that being a hearth tender and a community supporter is a very traditionally female role. You know, I liken it to how we have degraded our relationship to mother life and the earth as being resources. Well, you know, resources for the taking. Your work can't be seen as resources for the taking. It's got to be valued as much as you care and put your heart and spirit and intuition and love into everything you produce. So I hope the community arises to really meet your call and join you in this because I find what you do of immense value and really important in this time. Thank you, Nina. I really appreciate that. And I feel that community and collaboration is such an important aspect of this time and how we find our resilience and how we find our creativity and, and how we move through our emotions and all of it and how we get inspired. And yet, I can tell you, it's like 500 times harder to organize a course with like multiple speakers and things than it is just to do my own. Oh, I know. You know, I always like receive this like, oh, yes, let's do this and bring all these people. But it's a lot to take on. I want to at least be able to do that with a producer in the future. Oh, yes. Yeah, it requires more resources. It's okay if that doesn't happen. Like it is okay because I'm happy to listen to life and to <laughs> to move with it. And I I know that as a woman and a woman of color, like it is just a slightly more challenging path in the Western world. And that's also okay because that's the body that I'm here in and all of that. I feel like something really powerful happens in these spaces and that part of that, the, the bringing people together, it happens in the one-to-one work as well. I've just come out of a session just before this call and so beautiful to be there holding space for someone to just really shift some of the very deepest feelings of lack and lack of self-worth and self-love and 
belonging, not belonging and all of that. And I love to offer that, but I, I feel like it's so powerful connecting people. And then so much happens that, that people meet and they collaborate and then more and more and more and more and more and more. And it's just so beautiful how that all happens. For me, part of this rest that I want to take is because I feel like I kind of ended up producing too many things and didn't have enough space really for, yeah, that just, uh, it took away a lot of my time for the quieter moments, which, which I really need. And so, yeah, it's amazing to keep tending to these periods and they, it is like waves. And yet I want to share it because we're on this journey together. I feel like it's really powerful to know that everyone is going through it in different ways. Absolutely. And there are two things I feel called to share. One is that this is about bioneers as a parallel illustration, is that even though we've been doing bioneers now for 33 years or 34 years, I'm not even sure, we are still in an evolutionary process. When we produce our conferences, which people love, we always lose money on the conferences. We produce them, and part of our model has been that we produce this conference with 100 plus speakers. We take video of everything, we do audio of everything, and then we become a media company. And now we produce podcasts and videos that are both on Bioneers and also on YouTube. But the way we have sustained this organization is by somehow through prayer, through synchronicity, through, you know, purity of intent, we have been able to attract supporters who have ample resources and who have said, yes, I want to invest in this because it's the only thing I've seen that's addressing the whole picture. It's the only thing I've seen that's addressing everything I care about. And that's really, I see us and I, I see your work very much similarly as a cultural enzyme. like. Part of what you're here to do is to transform our culture, because nothing less than that is going to work. And how do you transform culture? Well, you help people transform themselves individually and learn enough about the structures and the alternatives so that they can find their way into where and how to engage. And that's exactly what you're doing. And it's a very, very powerful stance to take. And I, I just want to encourage you to, you know, keep innovating and experimenting. I'm always experimenting. Yes. The latest I'm going on is keep it simple, ask for one thing. So I'm playing with that. But in terms of donations, you know, that's always there on a sliding scale. And if somebody does want to come in and, and offer a bigger gift at this time to kind of just like move us through this period, that's so welcome for everyone else like just knowing that the way that the model works is 10 people paying 30 pounds a month costs more to run than it brings in but 200 or 500 people paying that 30 pounds completely births an organization that can have staff and can do things like future planning and can create so many beautiful events and conferences and gatherings and retreats and ways of bringing us all together and so it really does show you that power of like everyone contributing I know for me that there are ways that I just spend 30 pounds without even thinking about it and and often you know foamy drinks is, is, mm -hmm. <laughs> is one that we all we all kind of fall prey to so there's there's also an invitation just to kind of yeah just to retune into that mm -hmm. where the money goes and to honor where, where you're being resourced, because for me, if there's more coming in, I can pay the team more, I can expand the team and I can pay all of the speakers more. And so all that money gets like shared and really supports everyone that's contributing to this whole thing. And if there isn't, then I have to ask people to keep giving, which people are willing to do because we want our culture to change because we want something different and we want to be part of it. But it narrows the field of who is able to do that because if you are not in a, a financial position where you can give any of your time, 
as many people are, and there are people that I ask that I think are wonderful, but they just can't. And so then those voices get cut out. And so that's another thing that happens. I've put this before lots of other things in my life, and I'm always having a, you know, a moment of, is that still the right thing to be doing? Like questions around that. It's always a dialogue that I'm having with all of my mentors living and out in the natural world and the ancestrals and, and all of it. Well, I want to promise you now that I am signing up as a member right after we get <laughs> off the phone. And it will delight me to do so. And it will give me pleasure every month to help support your vision because I think it's beautiful and powerful and needed and important. And the other thing I wanted to reflect to you, Amisha, is that here I am across the pond, right, in in the U.S., which is such a crazy country to be living in right now. Because I know people who are progressive women funders, what I'm seeing in this ecosystem anyway is that you were mentioning the disadvantage of being a woman of color emerging out of systems of systemic racism. What I'm seeing here is that there is a predilection to want to support women of color in leadership and a recognition that there is a particular strength and quality of vision and resilience and connection to roots, I want to say, that many women of color in leadership carry that we all need to benefit from. And that it's part of tipping the scales is supporting women in color, women of color in leadership. So I think while it's a disadvantage, it can also become an advantage. And I would encourage you to hold it both ways. Thank you, Nina. We are taking just a short pause here. If you are enjoying this episode, please consider joining our community. For a small contribution, you can be part of our beautiful online world where we deepen the conversation and offer spaces of learning and practice. As a member, you are a patron supporting the making of this show and you receive a number of benefits such as special member-only events and discounts on all our courses, retreats and in-person experiences. You will have membership to our app and connect with inspiring humans around the world through a social network to discuss the themes of the show away from the eyes of advertisers and the manipulation of big tech. Our membership is what makes us able to stay advertising free in a world that is always trying to sell us stuff we don't need. And it is the very heart of all that we are. Head to www.allthatweare.org forward slash support to find out more. I do want to commend your book to anyone listening and say if you have not checked out Amisha's beautiful book on intuition, the book is beautiful and it's really you know, one of the things they say about writing is it's much easier to write long than to write short. And you deliver this teaching in the most beautiful, succinct, illustrated, it's really accessible and useful and quite a wonderful piece of work. So thank you for doing it. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that it's harder to try and explain the unexplainable succinctly. The challenge in that book was that it, it's not a book of stories. That's my natural way of communicating is to share stories. And so I had to strip back experiences of, and just really just try and communicate like what have I learned and how can that help to open these intuitive fields for, for anyone that encounters it. Well, I think you did a great job. And I hope there may be a future version that has some of your stories in it as well. Because having just released a new version of my own book, which I'm learning so much from and loving doing so much, it's wonderful to have a second shot. Once you learn what you've learned from the first time and come back 
at a later date and be able to do it differently. I have one more question to ask you, love, and then I may turn it back to you. There is so much of what we're experiencing in the world today that can be seen as an imbalance of the masculine and the feminine. On the one hand, both from certain governments and from multinational corporations, there's a war on women going on and a war on particularly indigenous women and women of color. And on the other hand, men are hurting from a legacy of misappropriated, misconstrued masculinity and a culture that has sort of uh, left them little choice but to be victims or perpetrators. So clearly, there is deep healing to do both on an individual and on a societal level about the balance and the reclamation of healthy feminine and masculine. And how do we engage men in bringing back the feminine, which really to me is the space of receptivity, the in-breath, the spaciousness, the darkness, the beauty of balance that we as humans really were created by nature, I believe, in order to flourish. So I'm curious to hear what you think about that and both about how do we reclaim healthy masculine, healthy feminine? How do we engage men in a gender equity discussion that helps them understand that this is about healing life, not about just women. What are your thoughts about that, Amisha? A part of me feels like I'm in a bit of a bubble because I am surrounded by men that have a really healthy feminine, which I'm so grateful for. Because if you can sit through the length and depth <laughs> of these podcasts, then like you have to be connected to that part of yourself. That's true it's so hard to witness what's happening and especially you know what the recent developments with abortions and how that's become like this women's issue and it's women and protesting about it of course it takes two and we know that it's not going to make abortions go away that abortions have been there throughout time it's just going to make them way more dangerous for women and it's going to affect the most marginalized that can't fly to have the, the abortions that they need somewhere else. And it really brings about how just that tenderness and that vulnerability in that dynamic that you could be with a man and there's just one thing that they can do that can literally change the course of your life. And then in this situation, like how much power that is when women can't like go and then do something about it in a supported and safe way. I really hope that men that, that are not connected to their feminine in the quiet moments can just really feel that and just understand how that affects them and how they came into the world. And that this honoring of our nature it's everything like this is our home this is where we live this is the water that we have to drink this is the food that we have to eat it's really that simple it, it's like why would we destroy our own home again it's just that thing where it's just like ah why are we having to do this work because it doesn't make any sense well, it's been a long buildup to get here. I was led through a meditation practice recently where the teacher was suggesting that the optimal state is to be in a state of unity where you can recognize your unification, your connection to everything in the world. And he suggested that we find something that we didn't feel unity with inwardly. And then he asked for a volunteer, and of course I volunteered. And what came to my mind was the extremist white Christian nationalist judges, you know, who reversed Roe v. Wade in the U.S. And how angry I am and how upset I am about that. And what it means to me, in addition to everything you named, 
And he had me trace back. He had me recognize all the emotions I felt about them. And then he said, is there anything in your lineage or in ancient history that you think may have a connection to this? And I realized that when I first saw the burning times and began to learn about that, and that this particular judge actually quoted a British judge from the Inquisition when he took down Roe v. Wade, I realized, oh, yes, I have the memory, an ancestral memory of that in my bones. And it is a diminution of women's basic human rights in a way that I, I can't stomach. And it was really helpful to me to realize, ah, all my responses are not only in present time, they're actually a legacy from past times. And it can help me hold it in a different way and with a different equanimity. But I also know that as life bringers, this state of affairs cannot stand. And I don't know how long it will take us to reverse it, but I do have to have faith that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. It just doesn't always bend as fast as we'd like it to, but we'll have this. Absolutely. And when you're talking about the present and the ancestry, I can immediately see like the future generations there in front. And we don't know what's happening. But what I do know is that more and more people are showing up, like more and more women are showing up to heal these deep wounds and to step deeper into like their feminine power. I love, I love holding space for that journey. It's the most beautiful thing to witness. And I know so many men that are doing it too. And it is happening. And so much of it is about honoring the mother and honoring the mother that birthed us and, and the planet that we live on and being able to understand like how much we've always been given, even if it's not perfect and how much we're still given, even as we are putting our plastic everywhere and all of the things that we're doing that we're still being given sunshine and water and, and food. And, and that no matter what anyone's story is around their birth and who their mother was and how they came into the world, that a human being carried them for nine months in their body and went through all kinds of discomfort and pain and that they were never the same again after they did that. Everybody, even if it was a difficult story, all of the other circumstances around it, that that's such a gift that we all came into the world with and such a sacrifice. You know, I'm watching my friends do it and it is full on. And so many babies don't make it through that period. And so the fact that we are here that we made it into this world, it's really such a powerful thing. And what are we going to do with it? Each one of us is here with some information for this time. And I feel that with every generation. And it's amazing to spend time with people of multiple different generations and ages and backgrounds. So we just kind of keep expanding our perspective and, and seeing what's possible. And we don't get too stuck in any of the stories. Well, I thank you, Amisha. And I love the new name of all that we are, because really all that we are includes how mother life holds us. And all that we are includes our ancestral memory and the future generations. And as you say, the particular gifts that are soul incarnated, I believe, to bring to this wild moment of reinvention in the world. And it is challenging. And it's also filled with beauty and opportunity and innovation. It's a great gift to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Yeah, during this rest, I'm going to start working on the beautiful leadership book and sharing some more of this journey and the stories and, and how we can anchor into these times. And I've really enjoyed spending this time with you and just really 
have so much deep respect and love for you, everything that you've created and the ways in which you share so generously. Well, it's so mutual. And I look forward to collaborating again in the future, my friend, and to seeing what comes through you in this time. It's a gift to know you and be connected and to this whole community, really. Let's see how we can collaborate to greater effect. Thank you for listening and spending your time with us. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on allthatweare.org. We give space to our guests to share their perspective without debating it or fact-checking, as this approach allows for deep, unedited conversations from the heart. We trust your discernment and wisdom to take what is useful and challenge what isn't in your own understanding. We offer spaces for discussion and integration in our membership community. We hope that you have enjoyed this episode and it has sparked some inspiration and creativity in you. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast. And so it's made possible by you, our beautiful community. If you loved this and would like to connect more deeply with us, please join our membership. For less than a tea or coffee a day, you can access our community conversations and benefits such as our app and member gatherings, as well as being a patron whose support makes this podcast happen. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen so others find us. All That We Are celebrates all that we are already and the untapped potential that lives inside us. It invites the full power of the more than human world, nature, the unseen, our ancestors and our future generations. It reminds us that we never exist in silo, through borders, timelines or polarity, that in each and every moment, all that we are is here.